Political Trenches, Local Government at Work, the podcast where Ian McCormick and myself delve into the heart of the most significant municipal news spanning Canada's from coast to coast to coast. Now, in each episode, we dissect the decisions and explore the dynamic landscape of local governance. Today, we are starting a new cross-country tour. Over the course of the next couple of months, we will be bringing on guests to talk about the municipal sector in each and every single province and territory in Canada. And today, we are starting by heading north to the Northwest Territories to speak with outgoing Yellowknife City Manager, Sheila bassey Kellett. But before, Ian, as always, how was your Easter weekend? Not as always, but how was your Easter weekend, Ian? Yeah, Easter weekend was great. I actually had the opportunity to get into uh, Whistler, BC, and I'd never been there before. So I it was quite the adventure. I, was, I really, really enjoyed it. Oh, that's excellent. We have three big stories that we want to dive right into right away. And we're starting close to home here in Alberta. Rocky Mountain House Town Council is waiting to hear whether Alberta Municipal Affairs will conduct another municipal inspection. The mayor formally requested the inspection, which would be the second since 2016, in a February 7th letter to Alberta Municipal Affairs Minister Rick McIver. Quote, Rocky Mountain House Town Council is experiencing significant governance issues amongst council, along with council and administration relations, end quote, says the letter. It goes on to say that council unanimously voted at its February 6th meeting to request the municipal inspection. The municipal inspection motion was proposed by Councillor Tina Hutchinson. Quote, we had an interesting year, a lot of feedback coming from the public and a lot of feedback coming from council members, end quote, said Hutchinson during the meeting. There's been lots of signs of friction on councils over the last month. In January of this year, the mayor sent a letter to council and administration asking that the town's lawyer sit in on future meetings to, quote, ensure a safe environment, end quote, and provide advice to council on appropriate conduct during meetings. Now, Municipal Affairs last conducted an inspection in Rocky Mountain House following a formal request from the town council in October of 2015. Now, Ian, for transparency's sake, I should note that I've spoken to the councillor who made this motion and will be speaking to the mayor for an upcoming episode of the cross-border interviews. So with that being said, I have a question for you. Um, it's a simple question, but an important one. Is this council not doing its due diligence by requesting an inspection before the matters get worse? I would assume that Rocky Mountain House is doing the right thing here, aren't they? There's quite a bit that happens before you actually get to the point of requesting an, an inspection in Alberta. Anyway, while you're being transparent, um, I should note that it was strategic steps that I actually did the last inspection for the town of Rocky Mountain House in 2016. So we do actually know a little bit about this. I don't necessarily think that they are being good or bad by doing this. I know I, sometimes what happens is councils will be asking for help. Sometimes so what they'll be seeing is the writing on the wall that Maybe there are a group of petitioners who might be asking uh, the minister eventually for an inspection as well. So I wouldn't necessarily read anything into it uh, based on the inspection itself. However, it does seem to be, um, if not a last ditch effort, then certainly a recognition that there are some certainly are some significant impediments to what people on council and more broadly, perhaps, may see as the town uh, running well in this case. So the, the the basis of this inspection request to municipal affairs is twofold. One, the dynamics on council between council and council relationships, and the second yeah. dynamic of council and administration. I want to start with the council council dynamics here for a second. There's always conflicting uh, personalities on any council. I don't care where you are, whether it be Rocky Mountain House or all the way out in Halifax or Vancouver. There's always going to be conflicting personalities on council. Any job that I've ever had, I've always been told that when you walk through the door, all the issues that you have with a person outside of work goes away because you're all there for the common good. In this case, the common good is the municipality. While you have been part of the, an inspection for this community in previous years, I don't want you to go into what you learned or what unfolded. 
do dynamics play a factor into requesting an inspection like this from any provincial government or territorial government? Sure. I mean, candidly, there have been two elections since we were there to do the inspection. To me, if there were lessons to be learned, those lessons have been learned. Hopefully, they have been uh, changes have been implemented. I suspect there are few, if any, members on on town council now who was there when we did this thing more than a decade ago, or about a decade ago, anyway. But whenever we find councils doing uh, at each other's throats a little bit, or certainly in disagreement that centers on personality rather than argument over issues, we find that oftentimes we hear people talking about common sense, right? It's people who just don't necessarily agree with one another. This is where recall starts to come in and people just aren't happy until they get what they want. And so because this is a democracy and ultimately the majority is going to prevail, there are some people who aren't going to get what they want, and they may repeatedly not get what they want if they find themselves not managing to make the case that other members of council uh, to, to sway the votes of other members of council. And when these issues start to get a little bit toxic, you find that uh, decorum goes sideways. People may not have understood it from the very beginning. Uh, now that maybe they're throwing it out the window, culture comes to play, Partici personalities come out to play. There's a lot of type A people on councils as well who are really good at pushing. And this might well be the case here if this is particularly an intra-council uh, type of a dispute. And municipal affairs, if, if they did get involved, essentially is going to look at is the municipality operating the way it ought to and by legislation and its own rules. And if the answer to those is yes, it can still be dysfunctional if the people on council choose not to uh, collaborate with one another. It doesn't necessarily mean that the local government has gone astray. Returning to our second story now, and we're heading to Saskatchewan, where the town of Outlook and the RM of Rudy find themselves sharing an award that recognizes the fact that teamwork is required to ensure that a community can face the issues of today, as well as look towards a prosperous future. The Saskatchewan Municipal Awards celebrate the excellence and in innovation practices of Saskatchewan's municipal governments. Four innovative projects from five municipalities are being recognized at the 17th Annual Saskatchewan Municipal Awards, scheduled to take place this year in Regina in conjunction with the SUMA Annual Convention. This year's winners have shown excellence in municipal infrastructure, cooperation, and addressing community needs. Now, the town of Outlook and the RM of Rudy number 284 work together to address concerns raised over the long-term viability of fire and rescue services by addressing a need to repair relationships within the region. The chief administrative officer for the town of Outlook said it was exciting to learn that both the town and the RM had won the award together. Quote, we're really excited and it's great to be recognized by the Saskatchewan Municipal Awards, end quote, adding, quote, for myself, one of the first projects that I was really involved with in Outlook was working on the Outlook Rudy Fire and Rescue Organization. So it's exciting to see some recognition for that, end quote. Now, longtime residents of both the town and the RM may remember that somewhat fractured nature of the relationship between the two municipal governments in the past. Perhaps the old adage the of time heals all wounds may apply here as the CAO says that the relationship these days is flourishing due to steps that were taken in order for both sides to start anew and gain a fresh perspective. Ian, is it time to put old battles aside and start working collaborative, collaboratively in more urban and rural settings, not only in Saskatchewan, but across Canada? Of course it is. And it's well past the time. There's no reason this couldn't be something that happens every day anyway. When it's the Hatfields and McCoys, you used an adage a little earlier, and I'll, I'll throw another one at you about familiarity breeds contempt. That it's important to elected officials from various municipalities to know each other as people. You live near one another geographically, so that means you probably have more in common than you have differences. And ironically, sometimes that makes it harder to get along. Just as a note, though, to the people who don't aren't familiar with Saskatchewan geography, uh, the region we're talking about is about an hour south of Saskatoon. Uh, it's one of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rural municipalities in Saskatchewan. And the point to that is we've talked about small municipalities in Saskatchewan and how many there are, how lacking they are in capacity for in, in whether they're rural or whether they're urban. And this is an instance where perhaps a viability 
and is dependent on collaboration with regional neighbors. So maybe getting over some of the personality issues and getting over some of the Hatfields and McCoys that may have existed for decades. This is something that smaller municipalities across the country and in Saskatchewan in particular, are going to have to do more and more if they want to remain viable in the face of so many pressures that we're seeing around things like downloading and uh, the political context of the planet and social media and some of the things we talked about what what's happening, say, for example, in Rocky Mountain House as well. So this is something they 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 ought to be doing and good on them for making that recognition. If we were still doing the municipal alphabet, today's episode would we have to be called D for Dynamics on Council because our third story also talks about the dynamics of council and that we are heading to New Brunswick where the municipality of Lakeland Ridges in western New Brunswick has had three government appointed supervisors in the last six months. Now, the Department of Environment and Local Government announced that Stephen Manu Manuel had been appointed supervisor of the municipality. Now, no reason was given for his appointment. Manuel takes over from the previous supervisor, Greg Ludis, who took over from the original supervisor, Michael Bellani, who was appointed last summer following long-standing divisions within the new municipal council. And the side continues to be divided, and sides to continue to be divided about the new appointment. The mayor who resigned earlier this year of Lakeland Ridges is praising Manuel's appointment, while one of the suspended councillors of Lakeland Ridges calls it as a major step backwards. Divisions have been brewing for a long time in the community brought together as Lakeland Ridges a sprawling rural municipality of 2,600 people taking in former villages of Medutic and Canterbury, as well as several rural areas between the St. John River and the Canada U.S. border. Divisions within Lakeland Ridges became obvious not long after the first group of elected officials came together. A council meeting last June, for example, didn't go ahead because councillors couldn't agree on the agenda. Then two municipal office staff, chief administrative officer and the clerk and deputy clerk treasurer went out on medical leave. Another council meeting scheduled for July was canceled because a temporary clerk still wasn't in place. By last summer, the province appointed Blaney, a former mayor of Gagetown, a su as supervisor, and later replaced him with Ludus, a consultant and former provincial deputy minister. The province's control of Municipal's Municipalities Act allows the government to appoint supervisors when a municipal council, quote, is not able to carry on the business of a council, end quote. In November, Ludus submitted a report to the province. Although the province has refused to release the report, it did release a two-page, quote, transitional plan, end quote, that include the hiring of mediators and an updated code of conduct. Ian, this is a fascinating story that has been developing over the last few months. Uh, I want to ask, though, with New Brunswick now a year and a bit since the forced amalgamation of municipalities across the province, is this the transitional growing pains or is this something more? Well, it's definitely transition growing, like transitional growing pains because uh, there are many stories now coming out of New Brunswick uh, about the forced amalgamation and what is last year when we bring people together. I guess that familiarity breeds contempt piece we just talked about. So another theme perhaps that's running through today. But in this case, yes, I think it has something to do with uh, the government, the provincial government in this case, finding dance partners for municipalities rather than having some sort of a process where they could find their own. I would also say, and you made the point that when four staff go on medical leave, that that's a, there's a real message to that as well. So it tells me something about will, about goodwill, about if there is no goodwill, nothing's going to change. And that is just, I mean, that's far too common, uh, but what's going on. I've taken on the role that they've talked about with like these supervisors who are brought in to kind of keep the place going. And as was noted in the article, these people typically don't live in town. Their job really is to keep the seat warm and to keep the place going until it can get back on its feet. So they're they're there not to make significant policy choices, although things like budgets have to be done. To me, those supervisors are there to keep the seat warm until, say, a, an election can be held to reinstitute a, a more, uh, sorry, a, a majority on council anyway. So... It, to me, this is something that is in New Brunswick, but I think it is something that 
but certainly around Atlantic Canada is being paid attention to. I think other municipality, sorry, other provinces and territories where they're looking at the viability of smaller communities, there are some lessons here that could be heeded as well. So it's uh, it's certainly not a great story. I hope to your point that it is growing pains that get over it, that there does become an identity as a new one of the new municipalities. And so people start to represent the new municipality, but not necessarily the place where they came from in the previous municipality, which is where these arguments seem to be coming from. Is, is this unusual for a municipality? Let's just take the context here for a second of the province or the municipality that it is in general. But the province to come in and appoint not one, not two, but three different supervisors or administrators to the mm -hmm. same municipality has me a little head scratched here. And I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, but we are seeing this not only in New Brunswick, but we're seeing this play out in uh, British Columbia as well with one specific municipality. And I'm just not remembering their name right now. But is it common for supervisors to get sort of shuffled out of appointments after they've been appointed and a new one to come in? Is there something that I should be sort of scratching my head about or is this normal? It, it's not ideal, but I mean, it's not, it's not a, for the most part, when somebody like this comes in, whether it's to this particular municipalities or one of the ones I've dealt with here in Alberta, even places that are where the province is, is help is helping out by providing an advisor, like I think uh, Kamloops, for example, I think in yeah Kamloops in BC. Yeah. So those sort of things aren't uncommon. Um, however, there could be reasons why one of these supervisors or uh, um, uh, could be have at the end of their term. Who knew the end of the year may have come around and their agreement expired December 31st. So sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. That said, there may well be reasons why, in this case, they they move from person to person, and it might be fit that somebody doesn't doesn't seem to fit the municipality, or the municipality doesn't fit them. And if there is gravel in the shoe from day one, then it's going to be really difficult to have a successful conclusion. I can understand that. It's going to be interesting to watch it uh, uh, develop over the next few months, and we'll be keeping a close eye on Lake Land Ridges in New Brunswick for sure. Well, we will be right back as we head to Northwest Territories to speak with outgoing Yellowknife City Manager Sheila Bassey Kellett. Be right back. Welcome to the Political Trenches, local government at work. Our guest today is Sheila Bassey Kellett, the outgoing city manager for the city of Yellowknife. Sheila has been a dedicated and visionary leader who has made significant contributions to the advancement of local government administration in the territory. With a commitment to inspiring and leading the way for city employees to continuously improve the delivery of programs and services to residents, visitors, and business owners, Sheila has established herself as a prominent figure in the field of municipal management. In her role as city manager, Sheila has demonstrated a profound understanding of administrative leadership. Through her tenure, Sheila has remained committed to the smooth and efficient operation of the municipality. She tirelessly works to explore and develop new, more efficient ways to administer city programs, constantly seeking opportunities for innovation and improvement. Under her leadership, the city of Yellowknife has witnessed notable advancements in service delivery and operational efficiency, enhancing the overall quality of life for residents and fostering a vibrant environment for businesses. Through her tireless effort and innovative initiatives, Sheila continuously makes a lasting and positive impact on the community she has served. So with that, Sheila, welcome to the Political Trenches. Well, thank you so much, Chris. I'm kind of humbled by that. Who are you talking about? Because <laughs> uh, sure, you know that the world of municipal governance is not glamorous at the best of times, and it's one that is rarely praised. Right? We always hear about, ah, my garbage pickup was late and raccoons got into it. What's wrong with you people? Um, so it's really thank you. That was a very, very lovely, and I'm very humbled by what you said. We're really pleased to have you here, Sheila. It's, and we should probably wrap up about now, actually, after that introduction. Just <laughs> yeah, say that. Okay. It's all downhill from here. We, uh, 
we, we, as I mentioned, we are just starting off on a kind of a cross Canada tour of, of the experience of local government in various ter in all the territories and in the provinces as well. And we're starting with the Northwest Territories. And given the esteem with which Chris has written up about you, it seems to make great sense that we start with Yellowknife. So with that in mind, uh, we will go back and forth a little bit, some questions. And since we are talking about local government, how did you end up a CAO or city manager in Yellowknife? Oh, through a long and, and uh, winding road, let's put it that way. I'm really fortunate. I, I grew up in Toronto and I went to university in Ontario and I didn't feel like going back to Toronto when I was done. And I, on a whim, ended up in Yellowknife and uh, did a whole bunch of things that one does in their 20s, which were very irresponsible, uh, but ended up being hired to do contract work on a really interesting project that was led by a minister of the government of the Northwest Territories at the time, his his vision being that local governments needed to have the respect and authority in the Northwest Territories and be recognized as the prime public authority at the community level by other orders of government. And what a great project to be a part of, right? I mean, this is this is a million years ago that I'm talking about now. But at the time, it was about empowering and strengthening the the, the role of local governments and recognizing that. So that was a pretty seminal start to my career. I'm really less that that was it, that it wasn't something like, you know, uh, research, you know, morgues in small communities or something like that. I got a, I got to do a pretty sweet topic. And um, my career went all kinds of places after that. I was a self-government negotiator. I was a, a, a director of uh, lots of things in the department in the government of the Northwest Territories that deals with municipal and community affairs. And that was great to see from the government point of view. Uh, ended up as a deputy minister for a period of time in the government overseeing human resources and uh, left that to do my own consulting work. And it was eye opening to work with a lot of local governments. And what I found was um, I engage with people way too much to have my own little home office where I sit by myself. And so the opportunity at the city of Yellowknife came up and I'd been so passionate about local government and the recognition about local government that I applied and was really happy to take on this role in 2017. And honest to God, it's been the best, the, 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 the most exciting career path uh, has been the last seven years. Um, I also had the joy of being a, a city, I forgot to mention this, a CAO in a very small remote community in the Northwest Territories many years ago. But I, I think to myself, uh, I think it's me. I'm gonna break this to you now. Uh, in that community in 1995, there was a massive forest fire uh, full evacuation of that community had to happen. And lo and behold, 2023, fast forward to Yellowknife, we had, again, the mass evacuation of the capital city, which was unheard of, un, un, inconceivable before that happened. So I think two mass evacuations due to fires in one career is quite enough. Um, the local government level, I can't say enough. This is where we live our choices. And it always strikes me as funny if someone says, oh, you know, the old uh, dirt dumps and dogs. That's all you guys deal with. It's so banal, blah, blah. Um, this is where life is real. This is where if you want to really think about uh, the impacts of urban sprawl and you want to limit what the greenhouse gas emissions look like and what our carbon footprint is, what better place to do that than in things like the zoning bylaw, where we have the opportunity to limit urban sprawl? Like this is where it becomes real. You can talk about policy decisions that, uh, that are done at other orders of government, but this is where it's real. And we have the ability to make that impact on people's lives. Flip side of the coin is everyone is an expert in what we do, right? Mm -hmm. If I heard one more person <laughs> during COVID say, you know, because we were very uh, watching, of course, what goes on at our solid waste facility. We have one of the very few solid waste facilities in, in North America, at least for sure, that allows public access for the purpose of salvaging. People can go in and salvage. Uh, to the extent that a filmmaker from New York came and made a film about the city of Yellowknife Stump. So you can imagine people have a very... Uh, many residents feel very a strong sense of ownership and pride and they're very proprietary about the solid waste facility. So imagine during COVID when we had to shut public access down. And if I had one more email saying, hey, you bunch of stupid heads, it's a hole in the ground that you put garbage in like, duh, what's the problem? Um, people, people feel like they know what goes on at the municipal level. They don't understand that it's a really complex regulatory framework that we operate within. We're seeking to constantly balance the interests of our residents with inadequate money, with the issues around 
our infrastructure pressures. It's such a balancing act in the world of risk management that that's what we do day in and day out. But it's so exciting at the same time because you never know what's on the other end of the phone, right? So it's everything from the big heavy issues to did, did you know sports tourism? There is a, an actual real organization out there that deals with arm wrestling and it's an organized sport and they want to come to Yellowknife. And my goodness, I cannot think of a better thing. Uh, they want to pair it up with rib fest. Like these are the things that come across my desk. Like how, 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 I did not come to work that day thinking that was going to be that arm wrestling and rib fest were going to be something um, that would factor into my day, but there you go. And I think that's part of the joy of what you do as a city manager that you have the ability to work with a team of people who are in, in the in the community, and they are the best ambassadors for the community, right? And so, whether or not it's a lifeguard teaching a toddler how to swim, or it's the the water and sewer guy that's stopping the water break in some residential neighborhood, our staff are out there all the time, and people see them all the time, and it's work that is meaningful in people's lives. So it is nothing short of an honor to be able to work for a municipal government and to be able to be in your community and do things to support your community to be a great place. What's been the biggest challenge from an administrative standpoint that you've seen creep up over the last seven years, not just in the city of Yellowknife, but I'm assuming you're having conversations with SEOs across the territory. Is there a challenge that you're seeing become more and more prominent and needs to be addressed sooner rather than later to potentially offset some major challenges that municipalities may be faced with dealing with uh, potential no one applying for the administrative jobs, no one wanting to work in a municipality. Is that a concern that the Northwest Territories has, or is it everyone just wants a government job, so we'll go apply for the government job? Chris, you have five hours because it's a great <laughs> question. So, I mean, honestly, um, post COVID, it's it's all all bets are off, right? And so, what we saw during COVID was we were in the Northwest Territories. We were quite fortunate, and we held off on having significant cases of COVID in until 2021. But that was sort of everybody was poised like a jungle cat, waiting to see what would happen at first. Um, COVID's changed the landscape. Um, so certainly when it comes to issues around supply chain, the ability of our economy to be able to shoulder some of that volatility is really pressing. How that translates to a municipality is our um, municipal infrastructure costs are, um, well, let me give you an example. We have, uh, we're going to be upgrading our fire hall. We've got one fire hall in the city of Yellowknife. It was built in 1989 when we had uh, 16 career firefighters. Population sorry, sorry, has, sorry, sorry. Did you just say you only have one fire hall within we have one the population fire hall, yeah. of, of 22,000? And we have okay. exceedingly talented firefighters. Yep, we have a great team. Um, but that fire hall needs an expansion because it hasn't been worked on for 30 years. So not only do it systems, but it's we've got some sardines happening, right? And, and so we need the expansion for the kind of equipment, for the services that we're delivering now that have expanded since that building was built in 1989. So that's great. So in 2021, we went out, we got a class, uh, or sorry, a design done. We got a class D estimate, sorry, a design with a ballpark cost at that time by the architect and engineer. And that put it at around 4.5 million. And then when we went out to contractors, we went out to a firm to give us a class D estimate. It's gone up to 16 million. So quadruply, right? So these are, and I don't think this is unusual. This is what's happening because of labor pressures, as you pointed out, Chris, because of the supply chain, because of the cost of doing business now that is just so much different. And so that volatility is carried on. And that's a really challenging thing for us when it comes to municipal infrastructure. The labor market, that's a great one as well. So we've definitely seen a change in that as well. We've had um, more people, we went through a period of time where we had quite a few pe people hungered down. If they were here in 2020, they were happy to stay at the city. We, as many, many employers did, we sent everybody home, be safe. Uh, if you can take a laptop home, that's great. If you're a lifeguard, you can't exactly take a life, you know, your, your, your pool home with you. It uh, doesn't work well when you're a frontline service delivery, but we don't care. We're going to keep paying you. And we'll figure out how we're going to get you to do things. And people really stepped up. And so, you know, the, the basically the lifeguards were cleaning the 
aquatic center with a toothbrush. They, they, they were just, they did an amazing job. Everyone wanted to be busy and wanted to do things. Then we went through a period of time where people said, you know what, I am really missing my family in Ontario or in Alberta. And if people weren't from here and hadn't been rooted here, uh, because honestly, I don't, my, I, my family, I met my husband here. We've had a, grown a family here, but who's, you know, I have friends that are like family here now, but if you've only come up here uh, in the last two years or, you know, just had, had a short window of time in Yellowknife, post COVID being isolated from family, there was a reckoning that happened. And a lot of people, uh, particularly if they had young kids said, I got to go closer to family. And so we had a bit of an exodus and that was really challenging for us. But what we are finding now is we're a pretty attractive employer. And so in 2024, even though we had a bit of a dramatic year in 2023, we're getting a lot of applicants that are really interested in working for the city and a lot of talent that's coming forward. So I am optimistic on that front, but it's been a cyclical challenge. And you have to find if your idea of if your hobbies are going shopping on the weekend uh, to a mall, this might not be the place for you. But if your idea is going on a great hike and being able to eat like amazing uh, food and do some different kinds of activities, um, build a snow castle, right? I mean, you know, there's a snow carving competition that goes on. You want to try some of these things that are just a really unusual and frankly kind of exotic thing to do, then Yellowknife's a great place to do it. We have tourism numbers are back up to pre-COVID, which is amazing. And we have a huge number of uh, particularly, um, I shouldn't say it started off as a lot of Aurora, it's Aurora view is what's attracting people to come in winter months. And so it used to be mostly South uh, and Asian tourists that were coming. This year, we've seen a record number of Americans, which is great. And Canadians are making their way north because sometimes it's just safe and easy, right? So that's a great thing about the north that you come. You stand outside on the ice with a bunch of people at 11 o'clock at night waiting for the sky to light up. And it's kind of goofy when, you know, you're waiting and you're waiting. And when it does light up, it's pretty mind-blowing. And so there's just this unique exotic degree about living in the north that makes it great that can counterbalance some of those challenges we have at the municipal level i so we are doing a bit of a cross canada tour here sheila what your experience you had a little bit in the south quite a lot in the north what are the ways you you see how local government operates differently in the northwest territories than say during the the south uh, south of 60 that most people may not think about this chris has already made reference to the title of senior administrative officer rather than chief administrative officer but that's only a minor one it's a great question. And honestly, I think there are more similarities than differences. Sure. To, to be honest, I think, you know, again, I was visiting family in India in fall of 2022. And I'm a geek. I had to go to city halls everywhere we went. Uh, believe it or not, there's people grinding away on property taxation in uh, Udaipur, just like here. So, you know, whether or not it's in the north compared to the south, I think our commonalities are much more pronounced than not. And certainly we see that when you have organizations like um, CAMA, uh, Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators, where you see people that are members from across the country. And this niggling issue that you're dealing with, you know what, dollars to donuts, someone on the East Coast is dealing with that as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, offhand, the difference is, I mean, I, I, for me, the difference is I will... I will not leave Yellowknife. I absolutely love Yellowknife. And so the the lifestyle here is so fantastic. That to me makes the profession, um, you know, there's there's exciting things that we deal with. We have, you know, fun things like there's a bylaw. Uh, I think we've actually removed it, but I just love it. And I hold it near and dear to my heart that there are no lions allowed to live in Yellowknife. Because at one time there was a guy who had a lion and he didn't put it on a leash and he walked his lion. Like <laughs> who, who does this stuff? Right. I mean, that's, that's the joy of municipal government. Like these things are legendary. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes we have, um, you know, a, a bit of a libertarian streak in the North sometimes that it is what it is. Um, the differences I don't think are that, no, sorry, let me go back. Maybe it is a difference. Thank you. I'm thinking it through a little bit now and not just blathering. Well, I am blathering, but um, we are a capital city that is at the end of a highway. We're at the end point. Uh, and there is one road out. And there is uh, 1,200 miles between Yellowknife and the next largest community, which is Grand Prairie in Alberta. So when we 
it's great that I can go and get my latte and I, you know, all the Indian spices in the world for my cooking, I can get everything here. We're a very cosmopolitan city. But when pressure comes down, as we saw in 2023, we don't have the ability to have mutual aid agreements. Um, when we saw fires going on in Kelowna, where, gosh, the fire is coming from the west, everybody moves east. Oh, it's coming from the east. Everybody's going to drive west. We don't have the luxury of that here. And so it was a very, very challenging year in 2023, clearly with the fires and the evacuation that happened. An evacuation that, frankly, had not been contemplated uh, for the capital city of the territories. And so all of the government's plans are, hey, when if, if everyone comes to Yellowknife, and at the point where if Yellowknife needs to evacuate, it is an interjurisdictional thing where we're talking to Alberta. And that's exactly what happened. So I think that there is uh, the remoteness is an issue, but it makes people a lot more self-reliant. People have to come up with ways to deal with things that perhaps you may not need to because you have the luxury of mutual aid. You've got the luxury of some different ways of, of attesting to uh, how you do business in the South. So regionalization, of course, you know, in the South, that's a great thing. Economies of scale are there. So in the North, there are 33 communities in the Northwest Territories. Each one of them has a fire hall, right? So a community of 200 and uh, Yellowknife, everyone has a fire hall. Hmm. So the, mutual, the municipal infrastructure impacts are huge. They're, they're a big consideration. And so the economies of scale are not going to operate in the same way, but everyone is pretty creative because you're put in a situation where you need to be. You have to be creative to come up with some solutions of how you're going to work together. And the way that that often happens is you're going to look at other orders of government. And so we are, the population of the Northwest Territories is 50% Indigenous. There are a number of really progressive Indigenous governments that have signed some really groundbreaking uh, Indigenous rights agreements, self-government uh, agreements with the government of Canada. And they are neighbors to us, the Cho and the Satu and the Buchin. And so collaborations on that scale can be really interesting and really innovative. And so our neighbors, the Yellowknife Dene First Nation, they have uh, partially embedded in the city of Yellowknife and then part of their community is outside of the boundary. We, we have a really intimate working relationship with them. And that's an amazingly exciting way to make sure that we think about reconciliation in everyday ways. It's not just, you know, it's some very big important ceremony where we will talk about government to government. It's, it's daily and it's daily to the point where uh, when I put a challenge out to all of our staff about how's reconciliation play out in your area of responsibility and the, uh, the public works guys said, um, I don't think this applies to us, right? Because water, sewer, roads, like no one, that, that that's our business. There's nothing about that that has reconciliation. So, okay, whatever, but I tasked everyone, go away, think about it. And the public works guys were the ones that came back and said, yeah, well, we do stop signs. We do signage. So we could do a bilingual stop sign. And sure enough, like we've, we've gone and it's implemented throughout the community where it says stop in English and in the Willaday dialect that the Yellow Knives Dene First Nation speak. And so it gets lots of comments from tourists like, hey, what is this? And it's a great way to just open up that dialogue, open up the conversation about we are living on the traditional territory of the Yellowknife's Dene, and this is their language, and this is how they say stop, and this is how we acknowledge and support that they are just woven into the fabric of this community in ways that are hopefully more meaningful because it's so everyday in its nature. Thanks. Sheila, it has been an honor to sit down and chat with you. And I feel like we've just scratched the surface. I, I know you said you're staying up in Yellowknife and I wish you all the best in future endeavors wherever you land. Hope If it's municipal politics, maybe if you run for office one day, who knows? Maybe those conversations at the grocery store will continue on. We don't know, <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us on the political trenches, uh, Sheila. It's been a wonderful experience to sit down and chat with you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ian. It's been an absolute honor. Thank you so much. Thanks, so our full, Take care. Our, our, oh, our, hold on two seconds. Our full interview with Sheila will air next Wednesday. We'll be right back after this quick commercial break. Okay. And now I hit. Ian, 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 we're starting a new journey here going across Canada. Uh, started in Northwest Territories with Sheila. It's a great conversation, if you ask me. She is a wealth of knowledge. And I I, I feel like if you, if you only catch this uh, sort of edited version, you need to tune in next week for the full interview with Sheila because you won't be upset. It is fantastic. How'd you think the episode went, Ian? 
Uh, Sheila is what Sheila is, right? You see her, she's she's face value. I love it every single time. I could sit and talk to her, go for a beer with her any old time. Um, so we are going to be back, like I said, next week with a brand new full interview with Sheila Bassi Kellett. Uh, and then we're actually off the week after because I'm actually on the road for the next two weeks and I'm the one who usually records and edits this and puts it all up on our YouTube channel. So I'm not going to be in my office. I'm going to be on the road in Brandon, Manitoba in Regina, Saskatchewan at the upcoming AMM conference and the upcoming SUMA conference. Uh, but what do you have on the agenda for the next, well, I guess now three weeks until our next uh, yeah. sit down here Ian. well i mentioned off the top that i spent last weekend on the west coast uh, next weekend i head to the east coast we're up in gander newfoundland for the provincial uh, managers association the uh, administrators association conference so uh never i haven't been to gander for 20 years so i'm quite looking forward to that meeting some people i haven't seen in a while and uh just yeah working out of our atlantic office for a bit so that's the big thing for the next little while anyhow if you get a chance and you meet the mayor of Gander, ask him to take you to the spot where the Beatles first landed in North America, which was Gander, Newfoundland, Labrador. Found right. that out with our interview. It, it, I That's what I go to Newfoundland, Labrador this year. I'm making sure I get there. So be sure to check that out. Um, Ian, it's, free, Ian, it's always a pleasure to sit down with you in the political trenches, local government at work to talk about the decisions and of this today, the dynamics of local governments across Canada. Always a pleasure. Indubitably. Talk to you soon.